Hawaii is a paradise, but even paradise has dangers. One of the, the things that makes this island so beautiful is, is just, just a dynamic environment. The volcanic soils are so fertile and that's why everything is so lush and green. But it's that dynamism that also creates problems for those of us that decide to live on the flanks of the volcanoes because it changes a lot. The early Hawaiians understood that the landscape around them could change without warning. The volcano's unpredictable and sometimes violent behavior reflected the personality of Pele, the goddess of Hawaiian volcanoes. There's a lot of different names for Pele. Pele's full name is um, Pele Honua Mea, which is Pele of the Earth. There's Kawahine Ailaau, and that's the woman that eats the trees. And then there's Kawahine Aihonua, the woman that eats Earth, eats the, the ground with her lavas overflowing. Traditional religious belief says that Pele came to the Hawaiian Islands in search of a new home. She traveled from one island to the next, bringing her fire and lava with her, until she settled at Kilauea in the southeastern part of the Big Island. From a geologist's point of view, volcanic activity did shift from place to place in roughly the same order as Pele's mythical travels. But the shift was driven by the slow movement of a tectonic plate over a hot spot in Earth's mantle. Each island is the top of an undersea mountain built from many volcanic eruptions over millions of years. Like the volcanoes she symbolizes, Pele can create or destroy. She is passionate and her mood can change quickly. In Hawaii, one eruption was unique in its impact on science and society. It started with spectacular fountains of lava and ended with the tragic destruction of a village. Everyone who witnessed it remembers it vividly. It started over 50 years ago. In August 1959, while President Eisenhower was signing a proclamation making Hawaii the 50th state, Kilauea Volcano was getting restless. Half a year before the eruption, the observatory was recording hundreds, thousands of small earthquakes. The earthquakes were caused by magma pushing toward the top of Earth's crust. And the earthquakes epicenter began to get closer and closer and closer to uh, Kilauea Volcano. Kilauea Caldera is a large collapsed crater at the volcano's summit with smaller craters inside it. At the caldera's eastern edge is a crater called Kilauea Iki, which means Little Kilauea. This area and other active parts of Kilauea are within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. The ground was shaking almost constantly, and uh, the ground was shaking really over near Kilauea Iki, so it was thought then that that's where the eruption was going to be. Another warning sign was a slight tilting of the ground surface around Kilauea summit. The ground was swelling, or inflating, as magma pushed upward. By mid-November 1959, Scientists knew where an eruption was likely to occur, but they still couldn't tell when it might start, or whether it would start at all. The seismologist was Dr. Jerry P. Eaton, and Jerry Eaton said, it's anybody's guess whether we will have an eruption or not. And this was just one day before eruption. <laughs> then at 8.08, .08, in the evening of November 14th, the earthquake ceased abruptly as the summit eruption started from a half-mile-long line of fissures, halfway up the south wall of the 650-foot-deep crater Kilauea Iki. During my years as a reporter in Honolulu, uh, whenever there was a happening on a neighbor island like Hawaii, uh, the newspaper would send me over and I would cover it. The action really got good when small fountains began to come out of the crack and the lava would pour down the side of the interior wall of Kilauea Iki and down onto the floor of the crater. We're here for the same perspective that people must have had on 14 November 1959. This was the viewpoint where 
Much of the public observation and certainly much of the scientific observation took place and the eruption broke out from a one kilometre line of vents, 12 or 13 different vents at the very start of the eruption and that persisted for only six hours before the vents progressively choked off leaving a single strong vent which became the magnificent high fountains. Molten rock below the ground surface is called magma. Above the surface, it's called lava. The lava in the core of the fountain was hottest, at an estimated 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. The blobs of lava at the edges of the fountain quickly cooled and solidified into cinders and ash. Material falling from the fountain built a cinder cone at the edge of the crater and fed a lava lake that began to fill the crater. For a crater named Little Kilauea, it put on a big show. Kilauea was maybe about a mile away from the Vulcan Observatory. We had a front view of the whole eruption. But when I think about it now, I don't really remember looking at the eruption. We were so busy. Maybe I just looked at it for a few minutes or so and rushed back into my office. I had to change the seismograph records, develop them. And so I, I don't really remember looking at that eruption right in front of us. But there were hundreds of terrorists. They drove as quickly as they could up to the park from Hilo and surrounding areas to see these fountains. The result was uh, really chaos. Bumper to bumper traffic for miles and miles and miles. Some of them ran out of gas. It was a big visitor's attraction, so my folks would come up here, and I was an infant, of course, I don't remember anything. But all they told me was how gorgeous it was. It was like a drive-in movie. People would just come and line the crater, sit there with their picnic lunches or picnic dinners or whatever, and just ah oh, and ah oh, and ah oh, all evening long and into the night. While the staff of the National Park managed the crowds, scientists worked around the clock to monitor the eruption. Scientists of the Geological Survey's Hawaiian Volcano Observatory prepare to collect gas and lava samples at the base of the fountain. Sulfur dioxide fumes and intense heat radiation make such sampling difficult, but these samples aid in interpreting the origin of the magma and the mechanism of the eruption. This eruption was a first, certainly in Hawaiian volcanology, perhaps worldwide. This was the first monitored eruption in the modern era. It was the first eruption where techniques were used in real time to chart the progress of the eruption. The monitoring that was being done at that time was really state of the art for the period, but of course by modern standards today, it seems really, relatively simple. They really only had two devices. They were measuring earthquakes with seismometers and the water tube tilt meter that Jerry Eaton installed was really put to the test. We call it a liquid level tilt meter. It was made out of artillery shell. You know, six inch shell. If the mountain is tilting this way, naturally the water would flow into the lower part. And that's what they're measuring, you know. Today they do not use that method because it's so labor intensive. They use a GPS and they can tell where the swelling is and where the collapsing is occurring. It's so simple. <laughs> a week after the eruption started, the lava fountain suddenly stopped. The surface of the lava lake started to drop as lava poured back into the vent like water down a bathtub drain. The scientists didn't know what would happen next. Was that the end of the eruption? Five days later, the lava fountain resumed at the same spot and started refilling the lava lake. After 16 hours, it stopped again. Then it restarted. Then stopped again. It seemed like Pele enjoyed keeping people guessing. Over five weeks, the fountain started and stopped 17 times. Each time, it followed a similar pattern. These fountains lasted for um, hours to days in some cases. And during the peak of the fountaining, the lava lake was being filled by material falling directly into the lake from the fountain. 
the lava lake level would rise, overtopping the level of the vent, and towards the end of the fountaining episode, the fountains would die very quickly, and then the lava from the lava lake would pour back down into the vent. Some of the changes happened very fast. The fountain in this phase rose from zero to 700 feet in a few seconds. The sound is the most spectacular. At least, oh, maybe 10 miles away, you hear the roar of the fountain. These were the highest fountains ever recorded on Kilauea. The highest was 1,900 feet. That's higher than the Empire State Building. Then, on December 20th. It just shut itself off. And then everything waited as the instruments recorded, where was the lava now? And it was in the plumbing system under the mountain. Days passed with no activity, but scientists observed that the ground was still swelling, indicating lots of magma close to the surface. Kilauea can erupt at its summit or anywhere along its two rift zones stretching to the east and southwest. It can even erupt in two places at once, In the last week of December 1959, small earthquakes became more frequent along the East Rift Zone. Scientists tracked the earthquakes for three weeks to follow the magma's underground progress. The quakes led them to the town of Kapoho, about 25 miles from Kilauea Iki. On January 13th, a damaging earthquake shook the town and cracks opened in the ground. Most of the 300 residents evacuated that day and sheltered in a school gymnasium in the next town. But the scientists still didn't know if there would be an eruption. Pele had fooled them before. At 7.30 in the evening, the flank eruption started. Through the center of the subsided block of ground, a series of lava fountains form a spectacular curtain of fire 3,500 feet long. The line of fountains gradually consolidated into a single tall fountain similar to the start of the eruption two months earlier. At Kapoho, those fountains were high too. Gee. The fountain erupted right behind the Kapoho town. The town had uh, four stores, one movie theater. There used to be a bank, a post office. A school, small Japanese school, uh, orchid garden, sugarcane right behind the town. During the fountaining at Kilauea Iki, most of the lava had landed in the crater and remained trapped there. But at Kapoho, there was no crater to catch the lava, so the fountain fed lava flows that spread over the ground. At first, the lava didn't approach the town. It flowed to the coast where it built out new land. Then it seemed that Pele's mood shifted from creative to destructive. Toxic gases from the fountain irritated people's eyes and lungs, the lava started spreading toward Kapoho. Engineers built barriers, or dikes, to try to control the flow of lava, but the lava overcame each one, sometimes within hours. We see at night this beautiful but threatening fountain at 1,500 feet, and it is now throwing forth a heavy new flow coming directly in toward the town and the newly constructed dikes. Now it's rolling over the dikes and moving in on us. There's no hope for our village now as we see the high wall of lava moving in on our flank into the backyards of the town. January 27, 1960 was a night of tragedy. And eventually the whole town got covered up. Yeah. yeah. No lives were lost in the Kapoho eruption, but many lives were changed dramatically. People lost their property, possessions, and livelihoods. The eruption finally stopped on February 19th. The 1959 to 1960 eruption of Kilauea started with beauty and spectacle, but ended with tragedy and destruction. 
it showed how quickly the volcano can change and exposed the limits of people's power over the land. Many generations have had to learn and relearn these lessons. The early Hawaiians had to be ready to adapt if Pele threatened their communities with her lava. They also had to watch for subtle signals that might hint at Pele's next move. Today, the details have been transformed by technology, but the essence is the same. Pele moves across our landscape freely, and we have to know when she's going to be changing, know when she's about to get active, or, or be very sensitive to our environment. <laughs>